Welcome to Gospel on Tap. We are doing something a bit different. This is something we haven't done before. Yeah, it just uh, never came to my mind until recently. And we are going to start uh, inviting uh, some good people on to uh, be interviewed and I guess interviewed and converse, converse, interview together um, through things. So you're going to have episodes where I just reflect on as a pastor, pastoral reflections. You're going to have episodes where the normal panel is discussing things together. And, and now we're going to add uh, invited people uh, to, to discuss things here. And so my first... It's a pretty, it's a pretty really good first. My first uh, invita- <laughs> invitation is with Rosaria Butterfield. Um, I'm going to, I can say a, a lot of things about her, um, but I- I'm going to let her just give you guys a- an introduction uh, for herself from her own mouth. So why don't you let us know a little bit about yourself, Rosaria, uh, for our audience. All right. Well, I am a pastor's wife in the RPCNA. We are the cousin denomination of the PCA. That means that we are, you guys are like our, our cousins with last names and shoes. So we're a very small, not a micro, but we're a small reformed denomination. Um, uh, my husband's the pastor of the First Reformed Presbyterian Church of Durham. I am also a homeschool mom and uh, an author and sometimes a speaker. And um, I've written couple of books on sexuality and I've done things like called revoice heresy which has gotten me into um, some hot water well it's gotten me into the hot water with the right people so um, so I am of the opinion that uh, as, as somebody who came to Christ late in life um, that the gospel is all in all and um, and it's it's uh, it can be kind of scrappy and rough uh, in these waters but the Lord Jesus Christ is all worth it. Um, so I'm sure we'll get into some of those details because I'm just a mess saved by grace, uh, trying to finish the race strong. Hey, when you say later in life, uh, how, how old were you when you came to know Jesus or he came to know I was uh, 36. I'm 60 oh. right now. So I was 36 years old. I was, um, I was a lesbian feminist activist, tenured radical professor in New York. I was one of the first, I was the first wave of the tenured radicals. I was a professor at Syracuse University. And um, were, you, were, you, were you, were you, uh, would you say you were very woke? Oh, I, well, no, I mean, you know, one of my subspecialties was critical theory. So we oh, didn't, wow. we, we, we didn't Go use ahead. woke except for maybe to discuss, you know, a good coffee, you know, brand, but, um, but yeah. And you know what? And we were true believers. Right. It wasn't like uh, this was back in the day when the year that Ben and Jerry showed up at a gay pride march. We were like, what's with this? It's going corporate. So, you know, we were true believers um, until I met the Lord and then understood the standard by which truth would be would be measured. And it was messy. You know, it was very messy. There wasn't anything glamorous at all about my conversion. And um, very grateful. I I talk a little bit about that in the. Um, not my first book, but the first book I wrote as a Christian called the, um, the secret good. thoughts. No secret thoughts of an unlikely convert. Oh, okay. How, how many books have you written? Uh, well, as a Christian, I've written, uh, three books with the fourth right now, um, uh, underway. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a good, uh, segue. So one of the, one of the things that, uh, I, I wanted to do, uh, with you today was to talk about a few of, your chapters, uh, we're going to address two of them in one conversation. I guess we mm-hmm. can go back and forth, up and down and around. Uh, and the first, uh, so the book is written about uh, certain lies that, that Christians believe. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't you tell us uh, the, the first lie that we're, that, that we're going to talk about being a spiritual person yeah. Kind yeah. Of, than being a biblical person? Like why, yeah, what yeah. Was, what was your thinking behind yeah. writing that that chapter? Yeah. Do you mind if I just give you the context of the five lies? Because that one oh, fits sure. in. Yeah. So the book is called the uh, the five lies of our anti Christian age, and um, these are lies that the evangelical church has just bought hook, line, and sinker, uh, either either in its minor micro forms or its macro forms. I don't think you know a bad principle is a bad principle, and the reason we have these lies is because in an effort to be missional. And to be a contextualizer, what what the evangelical church has done is decided that the um, 
the creation ordinance, Genesis 1, 27, 28, being born male and female in the image of God um, with certain duties and responsibilities, callings and design purposes, that's just not winsome. And so what we needed to do was extract the gospel away from its Old Testament moorings. And then when you do that, you get the gospel as an adjective. You get things like gospel culture. And then under gospel culture, you get five lies of our anti-Christian age. The first lie is that homosexuality is normal. The second lie is that spirituality is kinder and more gentle than biblical Christianity, which is harsh and hierarchical and not winsome. Um, the third lie is feminism is good for the church and the world. The fourth lie is transgenderism is normal. And the fifth lie is modesty is one of those outdated, uh, you know, things that are just intended to keep women down and really exhibitionism is better. Mm -hmm. And so those are the five lies. And so, so yes, I think the two lies we're going to talk about uh, today would be the idea that, um, spirituality is kinder and you would see that on like the the uh the coexist bumper stickers you know that were popular a while ago and and you know and i think there are many evangelicals who thought well my jesus would go on that sticker why can't i be on that bumper sticker and i think the challenge for people is to um for christians is to really not apologize for the holiness of god and the separateness of god and many of the ideas from this chapter, I'm not smart enough to come up with any of these chapters or any of this, but many of the ideas from, from that chapter comes from Peter Jones's work. Um, this is one of his books. He's, he's, uh, he is a, uh, he's a force to be reckoned with. Peter Jones is a PCA pastor and the founder of a, of a cultural apologetics ministry called Truth Exchange. He's in the PCA? I didn't know that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's you like, can see him at a, we'll all be together uh, yeah. soon. So, yeah, so I, that's, that's a good, the whole spiritual person in that, that book, it really, what he says in that book is basically like God makes the world uh, distinct from him and separate from him. And there's a major distinction between God and everything he's made. Right. Um, and right. so that's the two view. And, but Satan and, and and the world that conspires with him has this agenda to instead of embrace the distinction between God and his creation. And by the way, because God is distinct from his creation, he he manifests that analogically through making distinctions amongst his creatures. Mm -hmm. So night and day, uh, woman and, and, and male, that is supposed right. to be an analogical representation of the distinction between God and his creation. Right. But Satan immediately seeks to obliterate those distinctions between God and, and everything else by obliterating distinctions between men and women, right? Between, right. you know, things. And so the, the whole oneness, everything is the same, is really right. about making God like everything and everyone else. Right. Um, and the difference, like, that's all true. And that's absolutely accurate. And the difference or the thing I want to talk about is the way that now paganism has become the new close of progressive Christianity. Yeah. And so it used to be, you know, back in the old days, like 10 years ago, um, you know, we, you know, it's, it, it, you know, a, a secularist or an atheist would just say, I don't believe this. That's not my religion. I don't believe this. But now you get this, this kind of odd mixing of things so that um, you have, uh, you know, these new clothes on this old theory. And these new clothes are supposedly a kinder version of Christianity when really they're a heretical version of Christianity. It really makes you um, very sentimental for the days when unbelievers knew they were unbelievers. Yeah, it just makes you long for the days where you could just talk to an atheist. So I think this is helpful to just think about it. We're not dealing with secularism anymore. I don't think if we were, then we would have more room for Christians to disagree. But what we're dealing with is a competing religion that says the problem with Christianity is that it's, uh, you know, it's misogynistic, it's hierarchical 
it's racist, it's rape culture, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's why Christians need to wake up. Like it's, you know, it was one thing, uh, I think, and I like, I like Aaron, Aaron Wren's heuristic about, uh, you know, positive world, uh, neutral world and negative world. I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the history of the world, but I think it's a, it's a useful yeah. heuristic. Um, uh, it, it really does explain why some of these, you know, why can't we all get along? Just be nice. Don't use mean language. Uh, don't be harsh. You know, the reality is some of us believe this is a Jude 23 moment and we need to actually snatch people because they're in the fire. Yeah. And others believe that this is a nice dinner party where we're having a complex conversation about worldview, where Christianity is one, one among many. And we need to just win people over to the goodness of, 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 of the Christian faith. I don't know how you were won over to the Christian faith, but it wasn't like Ken Smith sat down with me when I was a lesbian feminist activist and said, Rosaria, you need to repent of your sin and believe. And I said, oh, I should have had a V8. That sounds great. Not at all. You know, I, I was mad and I went to war against the gospel and praise be to God that I lost. Yeah. And praise be to God. There was a Christian pastor who wasn't afraid that I was flailing around because he actually believed Psalm, Psalm two is true right now that Jesus is King right now. And so this flailing was going to stop. Yeah, yeah. So this is the kind. Of, so basically, like what you're saying is, oh my goodness, my uh, my uh, accordance just jumped up and blocked you. Sorry, um, my laptop is acting rebellious. So basically, what you're saying is that spirituality, uh, religion, which it's a religion, it's 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 a, another worldview and and way of practicing um, ultimacy, what you worship. Uh, it's kind of like the person who uh, believes that. When, we, when someone comes to church, they shouldn't have a 1 Corinthians 14 experience. When, when Paul says, listen, the unbeliever should come and he should be exposed by all, convicted by all, and fall on his face and say, God is among you. Like the, the spiritual uh, person would say that a, an unbeliever should come to church and should feel um, like they belong before they believe. They should feel um good about themselves and great about themselves. Um, but what you're saying is that the biblical person believes that when a sinner encounters God, um, it, it should be uh, pretty scary. Yeah. 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 And if I could just add one more thing to that, that's where the regular principle of worship comes in. And you just wrote a book on that. So this is where the, I mean, this is not an insignificant thing. Um, <clears throat> Ken Smith didn't, you know, meet me on the street and say, hey, you need to come to church. You know, you're a, you're a sinner. He said, why don't you come to dinner? And we could talk about that article that you just wrote in the newspaper about, you know, the Christian faith, which is, you know, that's how we met. Um, and that dinner led to another dinner, which led to another dinner, which led to about 500 dinners. See, Ken wanted to bring the church to me because for some of us, we're so outside the covenant, we really do need that. So this doesn't prohibit the use of hospitality yeah, yeah. for Christians to actually have hard conversations with their neighbors privately uh, at around a dinner table and not on Twitter. That's a really good idea. That was how, yeah. that was how, that was the. So we're not, you know, you see what I'm saying? Um, yeah, yeah. But, it, it, but, no, like there's 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 wisdom. Um, in um, the way you, you know, relate to people right. and, and whatnot. But but the idea that your church worship service is itself an evangelistic parade denies what we in the reform side of things believe to be true about worship, which is it's God's. It's not yeah. mine. Yeah. You yeah. Give worship to God. Yeah. This is this kind of spiritual person being better than the biblical person. It reminds me a little bit about the, the conversations. I know we're going to have a revoice conversation, but like, I guess we can, you know, it'll come up here and there. Like I, I was on the floor of GA uh, la last year and I saw a lot of men get up and they were discussing the way we give language in our documents um, to, you know, the sexuality conversation, the, the homosexuality conversation when it pertains to a pastor and, and pastor after pastor got up and said, what will people think 
how will people feel hurt feelings hurt 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 and, and there, that was one group of people and other people another group of people got up and they were saying thus says the lord the scriptures say the word of god says um and and that's what this the issue with this spiritual person is is there more concern uh with people's feelings and the way they're perceived uh emotions than right. actually being factual actual you know and truthful right. so like, it's, right. like, it's 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 more winsome to be um less truthful and more appealing uh, as opposed to i think i think it's more winsome to be more truthful um and and not necessarily like the thing is like we're, we're, the great commission is not let's go get everyone to like us so they can like jesus you know Right. And I think that's the thing, that when spirituality enters the evangelical camp, it becomes Pelagiast and Arminian. It yep. believes that we're not really, it's not really totally depraved. There's a part of Rosaria that is wise and intelligent and good and reasonable, and therefore she will come to the gospel. Now, yeah, yeah. that combines two things. We as Reformed people believe in the category of common grace. That explains how when I lived as a lesbian, I was still, you know, I was still somebody who walked my dogs and, you know, watered my plants and, uh, you know, tried to be nice to my neighbors. That's called common grace. That's going to send me to health as fast as anything else. Yeah. So we don't confuse that. And we also ultimately don't believe that the Christian faith, and this is a hard thing, we don't believe that we choose it. And we do believe that God has set apart some people for hell. Yeah, we do. We believe that. Now, the prop, the issue is that we don't know who those people are and where wherever there is life, there is hope. So there's no such thing as a living reprobate. So any person the Lord puts on my path, any person the Lord puts on your path, I actually assume is part of God's elect. And I will therefore share the gospel in that way over and over until they are sick of me, which sometimes yeah. happens. But sometimes they actually do indeed humble themselves, cry out to God, and we've seen people come to Christ. But that's because we actually believe in a gospel that involves being born, born again. And we believe in a gospel that means you overcome your sins. We don't believe in a gospel where you have highly intelligent, sophisticated, therapy-driven conversations, and then you all just agree to disagree. Yeah. We think sin sends people to hell. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Like, so if you actually believe that God is sovereign um, in creation, providence, and and redemption, um, you're, you're you're not going to believe that you can manipulate people emotionally um, into loving Jesus. You know, right. Jesus said, "You know, sanctify him, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Faith right. comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God." Right. You either right. believe that. Right. And you actually, you know, flush that out or, right. or, 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 or you really don't. And I, I think a lot of people, we were talking about this before we, we came on. A lot of people hold to a, a, a conceptual belief in God's sovereignty, but the whole missional contextualization movement, it's really like, how do we actually act like God is not sovereign and saves people through the foolishness of preaching, um, and, and all of these um, basically, you know, vague, spiritual, appealing things. You right. Know? And, and what I want people who are not on our side of this conversation to understand is we are not suggesting that this is not relational. We, yeah, we yeah. are not suggesting that. I mean, you know, we uh, the, I mean, my children, some, when they were little, they fell asleep. You know, they would bring their teddy bears and their pillows and they'd get under the table. We were still begging our neighbors to put their faith in Christ. They felt they would, you know, that was a bedtime story for them. They have heard and seen their parents uh, plead with their neighbors to see what God is showing in the scripture. They, they've lived in a house which is wide open for the gospel, yeah, yeah. where every yeah. night family devotions includes whoever is at our table. So. Yeah. We believe it's relational. Yeah, we yeah. believe it's honest. We, yeah. we just don't think lying to people yeah. in an effort to make them feel good, even if you're doing it just to be passive, if that makes sense, is a good idea. Yeah. And now that doesn't mean 
that we say everything that there is to say at the first minute. Yes. What it does mean is we put the word before people and we want them to be in the word, searching it for themselves. And yes. we want the Holy Spirit to ultimately humble them as he did for us. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. So like it's, it's for, for example, so it's when you, when, when you're engaging somebody uh, relationally, you know, not, 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 not some of the public worship service, but you're, yeah. you're right. I, 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 don't, I don't tell like a, like, like someone who struggles with homosexuality, something like a, like a, a Matt Chandler would say like, well, that's, you know, that's not, God, that's not God's best for you. Right. You know, when I get to that point, I say, look, this is a, uh, this offends God and it will send you to hell. And by the way, if you never were a homosexual, you still, <laughs> homosexuality is not the, 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 uh, the quintessential issue, but it, it is one of your issues, yeah. you know? Right. Um, and, and here's why it's hard today, because while like 10 years ago, it was a lot easier because homosexuality was one among many sins. Today, homosexuality is our nation's reigning idol with federal funding and federal demands yeah. that we all bow to the idol yeah. and sacrifice our children to Moloch, yeah. yeah. you know? And so, so it really is, a, a, I mean, I think what we want, what I want, you, you know, I want our listeners to know as somebody who lived as a lesbian for many years of my life, I would, it would be terrifying for me right now to be a, a, you know, to be a lesbian who might be thinking that the gospel is true, because I would yeah. literally feel like I was being torn apart by wild horses. Yeah. I would not want some, you know, quite frankly, effeminate pastor telling me, don't worry, Rosaria, come to our church. We have a sexual minority, you know, uh, you know, movement in our church. You can come here and be gay. I don't want to go to church and be gay. I like being gay all by myself in New York. It was yeah. really quite fun. Yeah. Um, you know, because I was a really terrible sinner. This is yeah. the thing about sin. Don't we all love our sin? Yeah, I mean, never love our sin. I went to a before I got saved. I went to a I went to a Buddhist temple because I was looking into like mm -hmm. you know I don't know something something right. And um, the the guy who was teaching like the class on Buddhism was saying f like he was dropping f bombs, and. It was repulsive to me, and I was like, "I don't want Buddhism if these people act like me." Yeah, and the idea that I'm yeah. gay like you, I'm drunk like you, I, you know, I'm I'm everything like you, and like, don't you want Jesus? Yeah. Like that is not at all biblically or objectively attractive. Um, not even to the unbeliever. Like I, I believe that I agree. <laughs> unbelievers are looking for people that are different than them. Well, obviously, I'm not. I'm, I'm talking about uh, some of them. If yeah. God's providence is working, they're, they're right. not looking for for you know. Yeah. I'm just like you, you know. I'm. Yeah. And, and this is the issue with um, a lot of these pastors who believe that the more um, the distinction between those who are in Christ and are not Christ are virtually indistinguishable, um, the more I think we're going to be uh, attractive and, and winsome. It's it's the actual opposite. You well, know? it's insulting to people, including unbelievers, if what we're saying is, oh, we're just miscommunicating. No, we're actually disagreeing. So yeah, let's yeah. be grown-ups and disagree. I have I have wonderful, you know, feisty, fiery, you know, honest to Pete, as we would say, conversations with my unbelieving neighbors. And we leave it knowing that we disagree on key yeah. points about yeah. how the world is supposed to work. Yeah. And then we also leave it knowing that tomorrow, if we needed help walking each other's dogs or it, that we'd be there. Like, yeah. What happened to that world? Well, part of the problem is when we in the evangelical church don't respect the fact that the world thinks we're idiots. Yeah. Hear it. That's what they think. You, you, you can't winsome your way into that. Yeah. My neighbors don't come to my dinner table and ask me hard questions because they think I'm going to be winsome. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, yeah. I, I can give you some great examples of that too. It's legit, but you'd never know it. You'd think that in order to be friends, you have to agree. That's the, not maturity. The spiritual person, uh, the spiritual spiritual religion believes that um, the offense of Christianity needs to be removed for Christianity mm -hmm. to be legitimate. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I, I think, uh, you know, when you read First Corinthians 1, 
it's pretty clear that um, the word of the cross is 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 foolishness. Mm-hmm. Those who are perishing, as actually God designed the way He would be known would be through this thing that is humanistically um, folly, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and so what 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 I, what I find oftentimes is. This is what I, I I think it's a little bit dangerous with the with some of the apologetic worlds. It's 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 I understand apologetics, but the idea that we're going to make what is controversial, questionable, strange about Christianity um, just greatly plausible and 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 logical um, and and appealing. I, I just don't I don't think that's um, supposed yeah. to really be the case. I agree. I mean, I think at best what we can do is arrive at a um, a loose analogy. You know, like I, I think that we can, but the problem is, is when you start arguing by analogy alone, you really lose the foolishness of the cross and you use, you lose the power of God to, to humble a person, to take away that person's confidence in yeah. his or her, yeah. uh, you know, yeah really basically lordship and kingship over, you know, yeah. life. Well, well, I think one of the issues with the spiritual person, the spirituality, spiritual person is that um, Jesus is not utterly essential for spirituality to exist. So it's almost like there's, there's, there's spirituality, either they, either they redefine Jesus or Jesus is not necessary. So this is the kind of stuff um, that will get an Eric Mason to say that, you know, Jay Z has done more uh, for, you know, Ra- racial reconciliation and 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 black folks uh, than the church. This is the kind of stuff that you know will get a guy like Loritz to say the NBA. You know, with you know the NBA with like their BLM propaganda, um, they're really doing the work of the kingdom. See, the thing is, like the spiritual person will not believe that Jesus, the biblical Jesus, is utterly essential for true spirituality to exist. It's right. almost like it's just. Anything that's just like nice and I don't know, like, 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 like uh, benevolent mm-hmm. is spiritual. And this, this, this is what gets into the whole social justice thing. All this mm-hmm. justice stuff that has nothing to do with the first five books of the Bible. Mm-hmm. has nothing to do with God's justice, you know, being, you know, uh, poured mm-hmm. out of Christ. Mm-hmm. It, it becomes like a, the, the spirituality that, that right. it, it, it's, and so it's right. not, it's and- not tethered to Jesus who personifies truth in himself right and it doesn't understand i mean i and you probably get these questions a lot i know i do too how do you balance truth truth and grace you don't you're a hundred percent truth and a hundred percent grace you don't balance truth and grace well, i don't want 50 percent truth 50 percent grace. it's nuts if you love god's love you love god's law but it, it is a serious thing because under this, you know, this paradigm of spirituality, which Peter Jones articulates much better than Rosaria Butterfield does. So I'm just going to give him credit right there. Um, what you see is this new Jesus, who's Jesus, my imaginary little friend. He sits right here, you know, and he's like, go, you know, <laughs> go team. And it's 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 crazy. And you know what? It's it's also really dangerous because it's leading people to believe they are saved when they're not. It's leading people to think common grace is the same thing as saving grace. And that should be something that should give us great pause. That is not helpful. Yeah. That is that is that is vile. Yeah. And despicable. Yeah, yeah. In, in Miami, the, the 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 spiritual person uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, you probably have these um, in your city too. But you know they'll they'll tell you that you know um, I'm spirit I, I'm not I'm not really into like the Word of God the Bible um, but I'm a spiritual person mm-hmm. and, and by right. spiritual person means that I pretty much do whatever I want and I call it spiritual yeah yeah absolutely yeah and you know God is inside me I am divine my feelings are divine and yeah. and I think that's where you get the arsenal of therapy talk that uh, the spirituality, you know, the spiritual side of the evangelical church, and I would say Revoice would be an example of this, you know, you know you're know, you a spiritual abuser. No, I'm actually a Bible-believing Christian, you know, proclaiming the word of God. Yeah. And, and what that's intending to abuse is your sin. 
and we want to abuse our sin. We, we, you know, we don't believe that coming out of the closet is what deals with my shame. We believe it's the atoning blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. And it's, it can't be both. Yeah. It can be both because there are hierarchies and there are binarisms to use one of those words that the world hates right now. Right. Those exist and those exist because God is separate from his creation. He's eternal. He's triune. He's personal. He's loving. He's awesome. But he is separate. There's no neutral ground. Um, and we worship a God who is not like God us he's not, he's not a higher version of us or the you know. no no absolutely absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and i think that kind of that that whole spirituality versus biblical it, it's what leads people to say things like this um being christ-like is not being masculine being Christ-like is being Christ-like. So, so <laughs> have you heard people say that? Like, oh my goodness. Well, and I think what what happens, you know, because part of spirituality, spirituality is all tied up with some of the critical theory thinking. So it, it's it's bad and dangerous and frightening, and you're you're spiritually abusing me if you tell me that men and women are different, creationally different, yeah. and designed for different purposes, both in the world. And in the church, yeah. that's terrible. But if we're all comrades in Christ, well, then I'm fine. We can all be comrades in Christ. And what yeah. I think, what I think that really confuses, and I think what we're pointing out here is that there are a lot of half truths in this. So we want to be careful as we're thinking through this. Yeah. Yes, every single Christian is to apply the the fruit of the Spirit. That's our that's our responsibility. It's our obedience. But some of those are going to really highlight the glory of man. And some of those are really going to highlight the glory of women. And, and maybe that's the conversation for our next, our next discussion on feminism. But that was something that I really needed to confront to come to Christ. Yeah. Well, I really well, did. Yeah. Why don't we, we uh, kind of go into <laughs> that a little bit more? Like, yeah. Okay. What, so part of with, this, with the spirituality world, it, it – Objective things, concrete things, creational things, uh, you know, God ordained things, they become somewhat like uh, irrelevant. Things like being a man and being a woman, things like our chromosomes. Um, and so, you know, if if spirituality is anti-creational or, or, or indifferent mm -hmm. to creation, mm -hmm. then, you know, we'll buy into things being reversed, things being collapsed things being confused, mm -hmm. which is why you wrote something about feminism. A apparently mm -hmm. a lot of people in the church um, believe that feminism is good for the world and good for the church. Mm -hmm. Why don't you like uh, un unpack that a little bit? Just Yeah. Going. And it's subtle. Like I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it's a, uh, you know, everybody is on the same level of this, but I would say for the most part, people, uh, evangelicals in general, uh, and, and you're really seeing this in that, um, you know, I'm just going to say it, the hashtag church Two movement, the me Too movement, you know, this idea that somehow men are really dangerous and patriarchy is really dangerous and, and the gospel isn't enough. We need feminism to help breathe life into the gospel so that women won't be abused. And, you know, there's a lot of issues here. And one might be ecclesiological. We are Reformed and Presbyterian. Uh, we do not, uh, you know, we have a church and a presbytery and we have a general assembly or we have a synod. Um, it is the duty and responsibility every for every woman who is a member of the church. If there is something wrong happening, you call the elders and maybe you call the elders and you call the cops. And if you don't like the way the elders dealt with it, you go to the presbytery. That is actually your responsibility. That is not being not feminine. And if you don't like that there, you take it all the way. You take it to wherever you need to take it. Yeah. But in a in a Baptistic model where all you have is a, um, you know, elders, you could easily see. I mean, I can easily see how you could get squashed at the, calling the elders might not be enough because yeah. what if the elders are all drinking the same Kool-Aid? Yeah, actually, so actually, actually, we're not working in that paradigm. 
I, I said that in like a in like a, a podcast. I was basically I, I mentioned the whole SPC, you know, thing, and yeah. I said, well, autonomous, uh, autonomous like ecclesiology, where every church is an island unto itself that does not have any actual judicial accountability to other churches. No, um, dangerous. Good luck with that. And then and then a woman told me like, how dare you um, make this about church about church government and and not about women? And I was like. It's connected. Biblical government protects people from sin. Well, and you know, that's why being a member of a Reformed and Presbyterian church um, is probably every woman's greatest defense against yeah. uh, abuse. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I know when I talk, I was, uh, it's a long story, so I won't, I'll make it really short, but I, I was accused, you know, that, um, boy, it sounds like you are defending patriarchy. Guilty as charged. I am. I am defending biblical patriarchy. I I need the good men to defend me against the wolves. Yep. And I know we have them. I know we have them. You know, again, we are Presbyterian and Reformed. We're not Baptistic. We believe in the difference between the invisible and the visible church, as the Westminster Standards put it. We don't believe everybody who's made a profession of faith is actually Yep. truly a Christian. There are tests of that. I mean, we want that. We certainly want that for ourselves, our children. But if we are to make our calling and election sure, that's because there are actually wolves among us. So when I hear people say things like, oh, 100%, there are no wolves here. Really? That's crazy. Yeah. That, yeah, that, well, that's in violation of the Westminster standards. You, There's the difference between the invisible and the visible church. And yeah. And I think that's part part of the thing about like embracing like you know the need for healthy Christ centered masculinity. Not, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but is is that yeah. men men are wired by God, yeah, um, to be courageous, face danger, um, be protective, and like yeah. it's funny how like one of the things I've noticed in the whole feminization of the church, feminization of worship. You know, it's it's a bunch of Jesus is my boyfriend mm -hmm. kind of like sappy sentimentalism. And, and, and the way people lead and preach, like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be, be courageously, boldly um, speaking against dangers in the church. It's, it's because that people have bought into um, this kind of thing. I think I will be careful because being, being feminine is, is a good thing, mm -hmm. but when men um, embody feminism, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. when masculinity is obliterated, um, that that's not good. And so, it's so, so it's funny, like what, what, what I hear a lot of times is being courageous, being, being bold, being a protective person, um, for, for your wife or your family, you know, for, for your country, you know, for a church is, is seen as being immature, childish, uh, abrasive and inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think it's yeah. related. It's related yeah. to, um, I think this this idea that like um, making one gender the spirituality um, is is what the church needs, you know, um, and it, it leads us to, I think, not um, have a healthy appreciation for like that need for men to be right. like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I would say anybody who wants to separate our conversation about about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman as, as image bearers of a holy God, because here, that, here's the thing. I reflect this. I, I am to reflect the image of God as a woman, not as a man. And, and there is, there are eternal and ontological stakes in that. So, um, you know, in our confessional standards, it's uh, chapter 24 of marriage and divorce. Section two says marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife for the increase of mankind with a legitimate issue and of the church with a holy seed and for preventing of uncleanness. Now in the RPCNA, we have a subordinate standard that is called the RPCNA's testimony. And what that basically was, was a, or, you know, it, it was a way that the church reflects on this and gives you some language for what this looks like. So this is what it says in the, the testimony section of the RPCNA documents. As sexual beings, men and women are in ordinary circumstances to marry for the expression of love, the satisfaction of their needs and the mutual enjoyment of each other, as well as the continuation of the race. God has ordained a natural order within the family. The husband is the head of the family, having a relationship to his wife 
like that of Christ to the church. He is ordinarily the provider for his family. He is to love his wife as Christ loves his church and his own body. He is to love, discipline, and instruct his children and to lead his family in worship. The wife is to be a helper to her husband. The scripture commands submission to her husband in the Lord. She is to join her husband in the wise use of family resources, the care and instruction of children, and the maintenance of the home as a place of love, cheerfulness, and hospitality. And it goes on. Now, I find that to be very helpful. And yet what I have just read would, you, you know, I am sure there are churches who would hear that. And this is right here, you know, in the document that we use. I'm sorry, I'm holding up the wrong side. You know, for our church, if you become a member of the RPCNA, you, you know, you get one, of, you know, before you become one, you get one of these, you study it, you think about it. You know, this is considered like, you know, anti-woman hate speech. Yeah, yeah. But we would say this is actual sanity. This is sexual sanity. Yeah. And I would even say that as somebody who lived, you know, for a decade as a lesbian, like this didn't first make sense to me. That's the thing about the gospel. It doesn't actually make sense to our flesh. I, I had to not only be a new creature in Christ, but believe that. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and I'm not saying, I mean, I, this is a long conversation. I'm not, I'm not trying to hold myself up as some kind of a standard of sanctification because you know what? The Lord knows I'm a very weak woman. So for almost as long as I have been a Christian, I have been married to my pastor. Kent and I got married. I was a baby Christian. I was two years into the faith. I have had the great blessing of that kind of coverage and protection and really daily biblical counseling. So I'm not, I'm not saying that God knew I'm weak. God knew I needed those, those kinds of supports, but what I just read to you, I believe with my whole heart, a hundred percent. I don't think there's anything offensive in this at all. Well, I had, I, I, here's the thing. Like if, if you buy into like this spirituality, uh, this worldly pagan spirituality, you, you, you will not believe that your dignity comes from who you are in Christ Right. His actions, his position, his offices, you will believe that your dignity comes in what you're able to do and doing whatever you want. So true dignity is in anyone being anything they want, um, as opposed to God makes me, gives me dignity in the last Adam's uh, narrative that he brings me into. Right. And so that frees me to be this kind of person, have this kind of life, have this gender, have this kind of job and have dignity. But if, if your if your dignity d doesn't come from, from Christ, um, then you're going to think that you're always being humiliated when you can't do something. That's so right. This is the kind of thing that like babies aren't humans because they can't do anything yet. Right. You know? And so, but. It's modernism, gospel, naturalism. Yeah. Yeah. The gospel frees me. To, to not need to have babies. I don't have to have babies to feel like I matter, you know? <laughs> um, I, I matter before the Lord as someone right. who, who can uh, not have babies, you right, know? Right. Um, but yeah, this yeah, yeah, we, yeah. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. I would say that every Christian who wholeheartedly invests in the creation ordinance as a beautiful, powerful reflection of, of God's, you know, perfect... Uh, you know, ar articulation of what it means to be an image bearer, you are blessed whether you're married or single. You are blessed whether you're fertile or infertile um, because we are, you know, I mean, because part of it is a body of Christ issue. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I think what we need to remember is that what humbles us in Christ can't hurt us. And that 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 image that Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan Thomas Goodwin gives of conversion where, you know, you have these two giants. Right. And one is Adam and one is Christ. And and you have these people like hanging, you know, a picture like, you know, like hanging from chains from Adam. And then these people hanging from chains from Christ. And how do the people get to Christ? Well, God took a chain from Adam and moved it to Christ. And then if, as you've said in sermons, you don't swing back and forth. 
you're chained to Christ. You, you, you don't you, you don't say, well, you know, part of me is an Adam and part of me is in Christ. No, you're chained to Christ. That is where your nature is. So, you know, in my case, definitely homosexuality is part of my biography. But the minute that I was justified, it was not part of my nature. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, I, I was still sharing a bed with a woman at that point. Yeah. And it started to feel wrong. Yeah. And so, and so that's, that's the, in, in the, in the biblical worldview, the gospel renews creation. Mm -hmm. He renews how he made us. Right. The gospel doesn't transcend and obliterate creation. That's the thing with it with spirituality, like God's mm -hmm. saving grace brings us beyond that nasty little first creational, you know, God's will right. stuff. No, like God brings me to be the man that he, that he, you know, creation, you know, designed for me to be, it brings creation renews me to be the woman, not me but the, speaking of somebody else to be the woman, uh, I right. uh, supposed to be, you know, like, uh, God's right. grace renews creation. Um, but in spirituality, God's grace transcends creation. And, and that's, you know, that's very, yeah. uh, you'll, you'll find yourself in all sorts of strange things, you know? And I think also with the whole feminization, uh, one of the issues with the feminization um, as good for the church um, is it actually, I believe it leads to the abuse of women. Oh, I, I, I it absolutely does. Yeah. It absolutely does. Because it puts women in places that, that they're not supposed to be. Um, so for right. example, like I was trying to give this example to somebody to, to be helpful. I was like, look, for my, my wife to be a pastor would be for me to put her in a place that God has not wired her to be and set her up for all sorts of uh, pain and abuse that, that she has not been wired to handle. You know, I, right. God, God made right. her to be, able, God made women tough enough to have babies. Guess what? If a man yeah. tried to have a baby, he couldn't handle it. You know, yeah. God made men to be able to handle, you know, the, 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 the difficulties of the pulpit. So uh, the picture I tried to gave, give was if I want to be fair to my wife and give her a dignity and I want to tell her, Hey, I know I'm stronger than you. Um, but I want you to go out downstairs and I want you to, you know, have it out with, 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 you know, take the role of protector and have it out with the guy in the house. Right. Well, guess what? That's right. not going to lead to her dignity. Yeah. And we get there. We get there because we like to think that giftings and callings are the same thing. Yeah. So, so, so you might have a woman who is extremely gifted as an orator, extremely gifted, uh, quite capable of handling the heat of a, a, a mob, um, but that's not a calling. Giftings do not create callings. And, and God calls no woman to be a pastor or to be a preacher. And we know that because we actually believe something that's crazy. Talk about foolishness. We believe that the Bible is wholly true. And as the Westminster Confession chapter 14 says, there are no manifold meetings. And even beyond that, we believe that the Bible knows me better than I know myself. I am that woman who is a gifted orator. I am that woman who has held down mobs. I am not called to preach from a pulpit. No yeah. way, because there is a spiritual terror of that as a pastor's wife. And I know God has not called me or equipped me to handle it's not yeah. about giftedness and you because it's you, spiritual because you're a biblical person who says god's word says this not well i'm really good at this and i, I feel this way and right. you, know, right. you know yada 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 or right. look you know no, god's word says it that's yeah 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 that's a biblical person <laughs> right and it's just, and callings are spiritual issues. It isn't just, I mean, I mean, giftings can certainly play part of it. I mean, you know, we want our pastors to have, to have pastoral callings and giftedness, but you can't have giftedness extracted from a calling or you will get the mess that we're in right now. But I agree with you entirely. I think, I think it's really, um, I think it's, it's, it's a really awful thing. And I think what you see is the feminization of the church leads to the sterilization of the church.
Oh, well. Yeah. And it does so. I mean, I think I would say Greg Johnson is a great example of this in his book, uh, Still Time to Care, because he talks about how really, you know, the, the eschatological, you know, finality is in this, you know, this in his notion of of a kind of eternal celibacy. So rather than understanding your marriage or my marriage, my marriage to Kent, your marriage to your wife as something that, um, you know, it will be fulfilled on earth. But the word is fulfilled. That won't be, it doesn't mean that it will be non-existent, mm -hmm. insignificant. And again, we talked about this before, but as two, you know, Christians who are also uh, whose eschatology is post mill, uh, you know, my I'm looking I'm looking at a Christian faith where my great grandchildren are, 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 you know, are, are leading the brigade and what our associate pastor Drew Poplin is, you know, consistently will pray that our church will remain faithful until the Lord Jesus Christ comes to this earth. Yeah. We are not, we are not single generation churches. And when I hear people say really foolish things like, well, I picked a church for the youth group. What? You know, at best, that's a single generation commitment. Yeah. No, no, we we we're here until Christ comes back. Yeah, and I think, I mean, not not to, not to go on a on a on a a side tangent, but I think your eschat eschatological views, um, you know, can affect this conversation because I think part of the reason why people buy into something like feminization um, is, well, right now, it looks like for me to actually be successful. I need to appeal to this, uh, you know, massive demand um, and you know, for me to like survive and thrive, you know? So if, I guess if you have an eschatology of failure, um, you're always going to feel like you need to make a compromise for the moment because this is all there is. And like, I, but, but if you believe that God not only did win, but and not only that he will win, but that he is winning, you realize that in the larger picture, like, God is winning. He will win. I, I don't need to make yeah. a, tre a treaty or truce. Right, right. And it's going to be bloody too. I mean, why don't we just say that? That winning, we're talking about a battle. We're talking about, we're winning in the Hebrews 11 way where, um, you know, some people won by being spared by the from the mouth of the lion and other people won by being sawed in two. They both <laughs> won. Okay. Yeah. Now, granted, in our flesh, we we want the former over the latter, but we ought never doubt that God will use our suffering for the good of the gospel and for the good of ourselves. But yeah, it's a totally different thing. And I think that if you have uh, an eschatology that is defeatist, you you can't you almost don't think it's appropriate to call your unbelieving neighbors to live according to the Bible. And yeah. I remember this, especially right before a Burger fell before the, you know, the, the, the gay marriage uh, Supreme court decision. I remember people, you know, even at, you know, talks and things saying, well, how dare you as a Christian, you know, suggest that unbelievers are going to live like Christians. That's not fair. Unbelievers are not supposed to live like Christians. And I would say, how dare you as a Christian think that it was, it's appropriate to throw a barrier between a fellow image bearer and the God who made her. How dare you see, that's what you're doing. If you really think that we should have laws on the books that aren't biblical, what you're doing is you're saying it's okay to condemn these people to the sin that may send them to hell. Yeah. Yep. How is that Christian? Like, yeah. How, yeah. And, 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 yeah. So how far down the road do you want to go with that? Yeah. And, and if, and if the law, um, I would not have known sin were it not for the law, Paul says. So right. the, the, this is going back to the, a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of things that's going on in this country right now. Like when God's law is embraced, um, it, whether externally or internally, right. But externally, um, that becomes the providential God ordained means for people to realize that there's something wrong with them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when, 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 it, when a biblical, when the image, when the law of God and the conscience uh, is actually written, you know, in a society's, you know, laws, um, people obviously through the spirit of God using that can be aware of their need for a savior. But when all of a sudden um, 
there is no law. It is lawlessness. You know, um, the idea that, that I would not known sin, but by the law um, kind of gets out of the picture, you know? Yeah. Well, again, it's, it's somehow thinking that the gospel is an adjective. Yeah. Everything's not a, the blood of Christ. Everything's a gospel. Nothing's a gospel, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a theme. It's not, it's not a style. It's, it's, it's the king of the universe who shed his blood so that he could have a people for himself. Amen. And, you know, one of the reasons that especially the transgender movement seems to really be capturing the hearts and minds of young people, I would say um, it would be daily if I, if I had time, but I don't, but I could easily daily talk to grieving parents whose 13 year old daughters want to have double mastectomies and hysterectomies over summer break. And the reason, there's a lot of reasons. One is that um, we have we have allowed um, LGBTQ plus alphabet soup to become an idol like Moloch. Yeah. And, and what this gives to some children, right, is it gives them a cause and a team. Well, at the... Why didn't the Christian faith, you know, like, isn't that, isn't that part of what it means to be Christian? Are you not? Is the cause of Christ not the cause of the, you know, this is, this is not a, a, you know, um, a a small cause. And to be a a Bible believing member of a faithful reformed and Presbyterian church, that's the, that's a high honor. It's a high dignity. Yeah. Yeah. I, you just you just struck, you struck something really important because if I've been thinking about like why why did people in the last few years get so passionately into you know the COVID uh, stopping COVID thing? Um, not that they cared about it, but what, right. what 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 was so religious about it? It was oh, religious. It was religious. You know what 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 was behind the 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 Black Lives Matter obsession? You know. What what is what is what is what is this about? And and I feel like man needs to be a part of something transcendent, and you know global globalization realtering. And, and and Christians actually have the you know like the cosmic narrative. And right. it, what you've really come to realize is the reason why so many Christians have jumped on to these you know uh, narratives uh, that are like you know life shifting. Is because they really didn't actually buy into the grandness of the ultimate narrative. Yeah. You know, I mean, if if, if Jesus, the last Adam story, really is as supreme as you say, you're not going to jump on every single contemporary bandwagon and attach Jesus to it. Right. You're going to look at every single narrative and you're going to proclaim the supremacy of Christ to hijack and take over those narratives right and, and bring them right. to himself you know and, and i would say that we we've participated in the problem by by creating this culture where christianity is you know it's like youth group with lots of bouncy toys and um and and evangelical conferences you know you get like little gift basket and a little you know and, and I, I you know i remember when you know i first started speaking at conferences and people would come and say you know you know, what kind of bottled water do you like? And, and I would say things like, you know, when they took Paul out of prison in chains, they didn't ask him that question. You know, when he spoke before the Kings, he was in chains. And what he said about those chains is really important. He said to his people, my chains make me bold. Well, maybe we are such wimps because we've traded our chains for the Perrier that the you know major Christian conference wants to give you. Maybe yeah. we started drinking the Kool Aid, and maybe yeah. we started thinking that somehow we're really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. It, that's what I think. Yeah, and I'll, and you also see that too with like we got we got to end this this episode. Um, but oh, I thought it did end. I thought we moved into the next one. <laughs> no, we did. We did. We did kind of like two in one. Uh, oh, okay, <laughs> uh, but. What I find interesting is like when what people celebrate tells me a lot about what they actually believe. And what I've noticed mm-hmm. is that a lot of men 
they get really giddy. I'm talking about like officers, like pastors. They get really giddy when a, a secular news source, a, a famous pagan, um, you know, I don't know, likes likes them, you know, invites them on. Um, and and it's it's amazing to me how the approval of Jesus, um, the approval of the Father, um, that we understand in our baptism, that that pronouncement seems to be um not really exciting. Um, but if you know, you know, Christianity, you know, what well, I shouldn't say Christianity today, if if the if if the times or you know, um, some secular person gives you some kind of like, I don't know, hoorah, hoorah, like people get really giddy about it. And it's, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the issue. I think I'm a a simple person like you either, 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 either Christ is the one who we gain our approval from, or you're going to get it from somebody else. Yeah. And Um, in the same way that I would say all of the evangelical flattery, do you want a Perrier or just a regular bottle? led into this wackiness about forgetting the importance of suffering, I would say our lack of honoring the Lord's day is what led to trying to find our celebrations elsewhere. God's given us 52 celebrations and it's it's a powerful thing. And when Christians, you know, just, just trample over the Lord's day, as I would say, I mean, I see all the time on the evangelical circuit and you, God hates that. Yeah. Well, that, that was hard to get torqued. Yeah. You know? That was, that was, I mean, that's another conversation, but <laughs> that, was, that, that was what led, you know, all these pastors to close their churches for like a year and tell their churches to go to BLM marches, you know, um, the, uh, <laughs> that's, that's how our reform churches grew. You know, they, they marched their way into our churches and yeah. like, true believers will, you know, it's yeah. just, it was intolerable. Well, uh, I think it's really good, uh, you know, uh, I guess diving into like those those two lies, uh, you know, the spiritual person is a nicer person than the biblical person. Uh, and feminism is good for the church. You said something before that I thought was really important um, to just to mention. Um, what the church needs is Christocentrism, um, not feminism and not and not masculine, you know, n- not not machismoism, but but the church needs Christocentric, you know, exaltation. And um, Jesus is the answer, um, not you know a a reaction from one polarity to the other. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll end there, and uh, don't worry, uh, we we have uh, Miss Rosaria um, for a few more conversations. Um, but for now, we're signing off. Gospel on tap, and uh, we will be back with a different conversation um, with Rosaria.